Well, today we're continuing in this series entitled The Church, A Royal Family. And uh, if you would, uh, just remain seated. But I want to read our theme scripture, which is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that says this, But ye are a chosen generation. That means you're a chosen people. A royal priesthood, and we're going to refer to the fact that every member is, uh, is responsible to God to serve as a priest, as one who, who goes between man and, uh, and God so that we might represent people to Him. But that's part of being a church of the open door, is, uh, is representing the Lord to others all around us. A holy nation a peculiar people, and that means a special people, that you should show forth the praise of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. This has been a very busy week already. I, I referred to some of the things that, uh, that, that some folks partook of. And remember, not everybody can do everything. I'm thankful for those who came out on uh, on Monday to help with the food pantry, on Tuesday out knocking on doors, sharing, ministering, sharing the gospel and outreach, on Wednesday night at prayer meeting, on Thursday night at the key leader training. And by the way, we had one of the largest groups. And thank those of you that are here today that went to that. We had a great group uh, representing Uly Baptist and we all got so much out of it. I heard so many good responses. And then uh, yesterday, the work day, those who came out for that, uh, listen, we're a busy church. And I'm thankful for those who take part in all of those things. But today, we're going to look at a passage I've entitled, The Ships That Sail the Church. And uh, we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. A rather long passage, but I'm going to read it quickly. If you would, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. And there are other ships that are important in the church. Stewardship is one of them, but that's not in this passage, and I'm not going to make it fit. Uh, we're going to deal with that in a couple of months when we get into our financial emphasis. But let's look at what this passage has to say about the church. Here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, Support the weak, be patient towards all men, see that none render evil for evil for any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come to your word today to see those things that the church must be and do. Father, I pray that we will be your church. Father, that we will be your church gathered to worship you and then scattered to carry out the witness throughout this community and to share the love of Christ. 
And now, Father, we pray your blessing upon the reading, the preaching of your word today, and we pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want you to think about the church as being a large ship, a sailing vessel. You know, some churches have lowered their sails in these days, I'm afraid. And because of that, they're drifting or they may even drift into rocky territory. Uh, Brother David Drake was sharing with me about a church that they had to call the, uh, the police, not because people from the outside were attacking, but because they were fussing and fighting on the inside. Oh, listen to me, that's a horrible thing uh, to have happen in a church where people get uh, contrary with one another. Uh, on the other hand, there are church I hear that have lifted their sails and have caught the winds of the Holy Spirit. And, and folks, that's what we want to be, that kind of church that catches the winds of the Holy Spirit and, and are sailing and, and are doing marvelously. And, and listen, in, in this day and age, it's important that that's the kind of church that we will be. But if we're going to be the kind of church that's going to sail in rough waters, we need to make sure that we are doing what the Bible has to say. And I believe when we are catching the, uh, these ships that we find in this passage, uh, that it will help us to navigate even in the roughest of waters. What are these three ships? Well, leadership fellowship, and worship are what we see in this particular passage. And the first one, I want us to look at it. We find in verses 12 and 13, I want to read this passage again, is under leadership. We look at verses 12 and 13. And here I want to read again, And we beseech you, brethren, and here's one of the first keys, Know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. And that word admonish means this is those that teach you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and to be at peace among yourselves. Church, every organization and every institution must have a leader. I'm thankful that in the home, that that leader is the it is the father, the husband, and, and church, listen to me. That's not the word of the pastor, that's the word of the master, amen? And, and I'm thankful that, uh, that God has ordained leadership. And mom, uh, you're a leader in your home in that, in that you're one of the parents that, uh, that, that institutes uh, authority in the home. And it could be that I'm talking to some single moms today uh, that, that you are the only authority in your home. Uh, but let me tell you something, parents. Children need to know that there's an authority in the home. Amen? And, and, and we are suffering today where, uh, where, where there is no authority in the home, and so uh, homes have, have run amok. In, in business, there is a leader. Uh, the one who is the, uh, the leader in the business is the employer. And so often those children who don't learn about authority in the home don't learn about authority at work and therefore uh, don't uh, hold down a job. They're not able to function within society. And the biblical leader in the church is the pastor. Now the pastor is not the authority in the church. Let me make, be quick to make that distinction. We believe that the authority in the church is the Lord. Amen. And we are governed by His Spirit, and that's why we come together in business meeting, and we believe in the priesthood of every believer. Did you notice that in our theme verse that we read right at the beginning, that we are a royal priesthood? And so when we gather together, uh, we are congregationalist in nature, and next week I'm going to print a section out of the Baptist Faith and Message because fewer and fewer churches are, are, are really operating this way where they truly believe that, that, that the Lord is the, the leader in the church, the head of the church, and that He functions through 
uh, a congregationalist uh, governing in, in that every one of us that are saved are a priest. Now that not only means that we represent God to man, but it also means that we come together and that we search the scriptures and that then in, in a congregationalist form, uh, we vote what we believe that the Holy Spirit is leading in a church. Now having said that, while the church, uh, the authority is, is vested in the church through democratic process, uh, and really what we want to seek is theocracy, we want God to be in control, God has still instituted that the pastor is to be the leader. And according to the Bible, the pastor is one of the gifts of God to the church. And these gifts are given in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, listen to what it says. And he who gives, or he who gave. Now, now that's important because... This is a gift from God to the church. Listen to these gifts that are human beings. Some to be apostles. We are thankful for the apostles who God called out through Jesus Christ uh, to, uh, to give us His Word, who, who in initially began the churches. And then some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Notice specifically that God says it is He who gave. It is God who calls out. And I am thankful for the, the calling of the Lord upon, uh, on, on pastors. And I'm thankful. I remember that day that I felt the call of God. I was at a youth evangelism conference and Richard Hogue was preaching. But really it was through the singing of a man named Ken Miedema. He was a blind uh, uh, pianist, and uh, he was singing about Moses. A and he said to Moses about Moses' staff, throw it down, Moses. A and he throws the staff down, and it turns into a hissing snake. And then he says, Moses, pick it up. And Moses said, oh, Lord, it's a hot rod. No, he, he said, oh, Lord, he said, it's a hissing snake. But he picked it up, and God uh, gave power uh, to Moses as Moses led the people. Listen, I remember as Ken Meadema was singing that song about throw it down, and I heard God speak in my heart to throw my life down and give it to Him. Oh, listen, I'm thankful for the calling of God upon those who will, who, who will pastor the church. Our Constitution and bylaws at Uly Baptist recognize this important truth. And this is not only in our current uh, uh, church constitution, but it was in our old constitution before we even uh, renewed it. Under Section 2, it says the pastor is to lead the church in functioning as a New Testament church. Now, this does not mean that the, church, uh, that the pastor leads it wherever he wants it to go, but did you see what it says? that the pastor is to lead the church in doing what the Word of God says to do. And let me share with you, this is an awesome responsibility. As your pastor, let me, under, let me share with you that I understand the awesome responsibility that I have to God. Uh, the day will come when I will give an account to God for the church for the work of the church and how I led the church. And so it's with great care that I want to lead the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Dr. Adrian Rogers said, Any organism that has no head is dead. And if it has many heads, it's a freak. Uh, let, let me share with you that uh, I, I know that uh, there's an old phrase that too many chefs in the kitchen will ruin the salad. You ever hear that before? And, and so uh, that's what Dr. Adrian Rogers was speaking of. Now having said that, the pastor needs accountability. While he leads our constitution, our bylaws also institute committees that give oversight to work. And I'm very thankful for that because church, listen to me, we all need accountability. Would you agree with that? And as pastor, I'm thankful that we are 
a family, but we are also a royal priesthood. And as priests, we all are accountable to one another. Listen, this pastor is accountable to you as well. And so we are accountable to one another. Now, what is it that our passage here says about the church? What is the church's responsibility to the pastor? Well, in verse 12, it says that they are to know him. I think that's important. That word know indicates a relationship. It's important that you know your pastor. And I can tell you, to this pastor, it's important that I know you. I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to know each and every one of you. And as I'm looking around this congregation right now, I'm looking around and I believe I've been in almost everybody's home. And if I haven't been in your home, I've sat with you to eat, to share, to get to know you. Listen, it's important that we know one another. It's through that relationship that we are able to share together. And I hope that you never feel a distance between yourself and your pastor. Listen, that word know is an important word and it means to accept him. Actually, the God-given leader needs to be able to know that, uh, that, that we are in fellowship with one another. That is so important, to know him, to accept him. And then second, to esteem him. Look at what the scripture says. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And to be at peace among yourselves. And once again, that next fill in the blank is to accept him. And then two, to appreciate. Him. And that's where that word esteem comes from. Can I tell you, it's not easy being the pastor of a church. There are battles and burdens that go on in the heart of a pastor that no one knows about. There are those nights that no one knows about where I'm walking around Shan's Hospital in the dark. Uh, Listen, that in itself is a it is a, is a uh, act of faith, walking around there and, and, and being in that hospital in the middle of the night. Uh, church, listen to me. Uh, there, there are battles that go on in, w- w- when it comes to spiritual battles in prayer over those that aren't, are fe- aren't feeling well, those who are sick. Can I tell you, one of the great heartaches has been doing so many funerals in such a short period of time. Uh, when, I, when I think about the number of people who, who, who we've been doing battle with the devil as, 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 as we've come to that final, uh, final resting place at the cemetery. Listen, I am thankful for the opportunity not only to know the congregation, uh, but, but also uh, in order that we might uh, work together in the Lord and be together in those tough times. And then three, in our passage, it says to accept Him, to appreciate Him. And then third, it says to love Him. And this is a point at which three weeks ago in the evening service, there was a perfect place in order just to stop and for this pastor to say thank you for the way that you've loved Him. And this is a place in this service where I get to do that in the morning. Because this past year has been very difficult for Donna and myself. A diagnosis of cancer and a dire warning from a doctor. At the same time where I was getting ready to have this ankle surgery, it had gotten so bad where uh, there is one of our members who have since passed away and I was going to the hospital. And it seemed like every hundred yards, I had to just stop and sit down because I just couldn't go any farther on my ankle. And then approaching that surgery for my ankle right after Don had had that cancer surgery. Church, you are a loving congregation. And I am very blessed to be your pastor. And I just want to say at this point, thank you for the incredible love and care 
that you have shown to me and Donna this past year. Um, I, I honestly don't know what I'd do without my church family. And I hope that you feel the same way. That you don't know what you would do without your church family. And then four, to follow your pastor. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Listen, when God's leader is led by the Spirit of God in accordance with the Word of God, he is to be followed. And when he gets away from the Word, uh, listen to me, that's a time when he needs to be admonished, and that means instructed as well. But notice what the passage is talking about. It talks about that we might work together, that we might serve together in love and in fellowship. And that brings us to our next point. We've gone from leadership to fellowship. And we see that in verses 14 and 15. And we're just taking these verses and exegeting them this morning. Now we exhort you, brethren, and warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, he's talking about you. No, feeble-minded here doesn't mean uh, lack of intelligence. It means to, to be fearful. And we all get fearful. Comfort those who become fearful. Support the weak. Be patient towards all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. These verses are addressed, did you see that, to the brethren. And again, it picks up the the idea that we are a royal family. Bill Gaither wrote, you will notice that we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Oh, listen, I like that song. I used to be a member of a church where we used to sing it every Sunday night, uh, kind of like here. We, uh, we, we sing our song on Sunday night. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. But can I tell you something? Uh, as being a dad, you know, Donna's, been out on, uh, on Amazon Prime and watching Father Knows Best and Perry Mason. We, we've added Father Knows Best to Perry Mason now. Uh, but, but, but as a dad, one of the things that would drive me crazy was when everybody was fussing in the car. Now I know that never happened in your car. <laughs> that, that never happened in your home. But, but the kids would be in the back seat. And I'd say, now, let's just pretend there's a line down the back seat. Can you just stay to yourselves and not bother one another? No, they can't do that. Because they want some of dad's attention. You, you know, when the family starts fussing and fighting, it's no fun. Amen? Now, some of you can't say amen because your family never fusses and fights. But can I tell you something? God doesn't like it when his family fusses and fights. Amen? Can you imagine how it breaks the heart of God when his family is fussing and fighting? But on the other hand, nothing is quite as sweet as when God's family is getting along. Amen? Nothing is quite as sweet as when the family is all together. And everything is great. Listen, I'm thankful that uh, one time of the year that me and my family gets together, my extended family, my sister, is Thanksgiving. And, and, and what a joy it is when we're, when we're all together and everybody is spending those sweet moments together. And the same is, church with, uh, same is true at church when we're all together. So Paul gives some practical advice on how to have sweet fellowship in the church. And I've got to do this quickly. First, he says, warn them that are unruly. 
And that word unruly means when we get out of line with God and His Word, uh, we need somebody who lovingly will say, hey, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not following the Word here. Amen? And so it's a blessing, not a curse, to have one another that we might be warned. And then second, he says comfort the feeble-minded. And once again, that word feeble-minded means the fearful. I'm thankful Sandy sang just a moment ago, Not for a moment will you forsake me. Listen, church. We've all gone through those times when we get fearful. It could be something we see on the news. It could be something that we encounter at the doctor's office. It could be something that we encounter on the road. But something causes us to have our faith shaken. And we need to be comforted. Uh, First of all, I'm thankful for the comforting of the Holy Spirit. But church, I'm thankful for the comfort of the church family. And so we are to comfort one another. You know, it would be easy just to say, now don't be fearful. But sometimes we need comfort, don't we? Somebody to come and take us by the hand. Somebody that's going to be there for us. And so third, notice what it says. Encourage them that are weak. And, And those that are weak are those who become spiritually immature. Listen, we've all been there, amen, where we've needed to be encouraged. In fact, when the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but instead, what are we supposed to do? Encourage one another as we see the day approaching. And folks, I I, I see that day approaching. And I have to admit, there are times when I've been Fearful, and there are times that I need encouragement. And then fourth, be patient uh, towards all. Aren't you grateful that God was patient with you? Listen, because God's been patient with you and your failings, we need to be patient with one another in times of failings. And then finally, do not render evil for evil unto any man. Do you see how these admonitions or instructions will help us to keep the fellowship in the church? I will tell you that if the unruly go uncorrected, they will eventually destroy the fellowship. There needs to be correction. The feeble-minded, if they're not encouraged, they'll grow fearful and they'll fade away. If the weak are not helped, they will fall into heresy. And if we are not patient with one another, we will come apart at the seams. And if we render evil for evil, the church will become a battleground. And so we've seen leadership, we've seen fellowship, and now in this same passage, we see the importance of worship. And we found this this in verses 16 through 22. I want to read it again. Worship. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. One, the most important activities of the church is worship. Amen. We need to gather for worship. If we're not gathering for worship, we're not going to scatter for witness. Now let me just say a few things. Worship is not dead formalism. Didn't the music excite you today? I was excited about the music today. And I looked around and I noticed so many folks singing today. Listen, it's been said that we have a singing faith. I'm thankful that it's not dead formalism But let me also share with you, it's not to be an entertainment show. And I'm afraid that some come to church expecting to be entertained. It's almost like people fold their hands and say, bless me if you can. Entertain me, I want to be entertained. Listen, too many people 
think that worship is about them. When in fact, worship is about the Lord. Amen? And, and we get caught up arguing about style. Folks, it's not about style. It's about substance. It's about worshiping the Lord God. He is an audience of one when we sing, whether it's a more modern song or whether it's an old hymn or whether it comes straight from the Scripture. He is the audience. And Paul lists several key elements to worship. Let's look at these and you tell me if this is not a part of our worship. First of all, rejoice. Be joyful, amen. Second of all, be prayerful. Pray without ceasing. Uh, prayer is a, a continual conversation with God. It doesn't mean that for seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you're on your knees doing the talking. But it does mean that wherever you go, whatever you're doing, uh, you're conversing with your Father in heaven. Verse 18 says, be thankful. Listen, gratitude should mark the life of a Christian. Amen. Uh, me and Donna saw a guy on TV the other day. He had one of those red hats on. It said, make America something. And his hat said, make America grateful. I like that hat. Amen. Just think how that would change America if we all made a commitment, whether your hat was blue or red, to make America grateful. Amen. If we all decided that we were going to stop and give thanks for the freedoms that we have. Amen. If we were going to be grateful people. Uh, listen, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a big admonition for America. What about the church? That's who Paul's addressing. Of all people, shouldn't those of us in the church be grateful? Amen. Instead of belly aching about what we don't have, we ought to be grateful for what God has blessed us with. Amen. Be grateful. Make the church grateful again. <laughs> and then verse 19 says, Quench not the Spirit. And that means don't be rebellious to the Holy Spirit. Don't say no to the Spirit in worship. And then verse 20 says, Do not despise prophesying. In other words, don't grow tired of the preaching. And then verse 21 says, prove all things. Now this is really important. Because even from the things that the pastor says from the pulpit, everything you hear may not necessarily be true. And therefore, we are to prove what we hear, whether it's in conversation at church, or whether it's in the preaching, or whether it's in the teaching. We need to prove everything by this word right here. Amen? Because this is the word of God. So prove it all. Make sure that what we're listening to is truth. And then verse 22 says abstain from evil. In fact it says abstain from every kind of evil. It is a correct translation of that. Because it's difficult to abstain from everybody's appearance of what they think is evil. And sometimes you're doing something good when it may appear to be evil to somebody else. <laughs> I'll never forget, somebody gave their address on a card in my first church that they were, they were living at the bar. And so we sent out a visitation team not knowing what the address went to, <laughs> and they went to the bar. And, uh, and a deacon and, a, and another individual said, well, here we go. And, and they went into the bar looking for the fella. And sure enough, they found him. And you know what happened? They led him to the Lord. Amen. But for somebody else, they made a, they, they made a well, he shouldn't have went in there. But you know something? That deacon and that visitor at that moment had to do what the Spirit led them to do. Amen. So you may not always abstain from what somebody else thinks is the appearance of evil. But it does say, listen to what the Word of God really says there, abstain from all forms or types of evil. Now at the same time, 
You may have pulled up there and said, you know, I can't go in there. And you drove off. You know, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Amen. And, and so, whatever it is, we need to be careful that we are abstaining from all kinds of evil. Well, let me conclude. The Lord promises to save His church. And that's what Sandy was singing about just a moment ago. First of all, it says He will sanctify you, which means the Lord will set you apart for His service. Have you been set apart by the Lord? Have you been called out of the darkness and called into His marvelous light? Listen, verse 34, 24 says, He who calls you is faithful who will do it. I'm thankful that when I gave my heart to the Lord and He promised to take me to heaven and give me eternal life, the Word of God says He'll do it. I'm thankful that as Sandy sang that the Lord will never leave you, He'll never forsake you, He'll do it. He'll be there with you. And then look at this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Remember what grace is? God's riches at Christ's expense. Have you been called out of darkness and in the light? Do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? That you have a relationship with the Lord because He'll do it. And have you experienced God's marvelous grace, God's riches at Christ's expense? Have you been saved? Do you know for certain you have eternal life? Are you sure of that today? Can you honestly say, Jesus is the King of my life?